this way. The meeting of the Public Safety Committee is now called to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? <coughs> Uh, we're here today as a committee to have a conversation with and get some information from the, both our police commissioner there and the director of public safety as it relates to policing and safety issues in the city. Uh, our committee has periodically done this to get updated as to how uh, things are going, uh, what are the crime issues, and how the department is addressing them. I believe this is the first time we've had this um, entourage with us here today that you brought and we certainly appreciate your responding so quickly to our request. Uh, we'll start off with the uh, Director of Public Safety and you have a series of individuals after that that you can introduce. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before your committee today. Public safety, transparency, and accountability are paramount to Mayor Krusen and me. Like most cities in the United States, St. Louis is experiencing a decline in serious nonviolent crimes. While we were experiencing similar decline in homicides for the eight for the first eight months of this year, in September and October, our homicide numbers increased rapidly. We moved from 25 homicides below in September to six below today as compared to last year. As a result, our police department is proactively focusing on Dutchtown, Gravois Park, Baden, and the Rectangle in order to prevent more homicides. Because of the January 2017 permitless gun carry law and the associated increased in gun possession and gun violence. I hope to obtain support for a state legislative solution to gun crime we have in St. Louis by the amendment of the Armed Criminal Action Statute in Missouri. I believe that gun violence would be reduced if the Armed Criminal Action Statute was amended to require that the charge of armed criminal action be filed any time there is a non-fatal or fatal shooting of anyone in Missouri, including if per perpetrated by a first-time offender. And further, that upon a plea of guilty or a finding of guilt for a non-fatal gun assault, the convicted defendant shall be sentenced to a mandatory minimum of 15 years in prison without the eligibility of probation or parole, and that a mandatory minimum of 25 years in prison be imposed for a defendant convicted of any class homicide without the eligibility of probation or parole. <coughs> Moreover, we have solicited a long-term initiative planned with a federal agency to attack violence or violent gun crime in our city. The police is also addressing the connection between homicides and drugs and our juveniles. Chief Hayden is here with the area commanders, Lieutenant Colonel Robinson, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, and Lieutenant Colonel Layshock. They will give you reports on crimes in their areas, crime trends, and plans to help law enforcement reduce the crime. I am compelled to address a few matters before they give their reports. The same people that argue in favor of everyone carrying a gun 
in our state or the same folk that are critical that there is too much gun violence. If we would give the police the authority to enforce gun control, we can get faster control of gun violence. Second, I've heard the many arguments in favor of stop and frisk and African American men bearing the brunt as offenders. Presuming that all African American men are violent is ludicrous. Yet, I know that the vast amount of gun violence in the city of St. Louis is committed by black men. I also know that the vast majority of victims of gun violence in the city of St. Louis are black men. Mr. Chairperson, at this time, Chief Hayden will give you an overall look at crime and then we will have an opportunity at the conclusion to answer your question. I caution you that there is a lot of investigation that's going on and that we may in some instances be constrained and not be able to answer all of your questions. We mean no disrespect by that, but just are simply doing what we think is prudent for law enforcement investigations and the citizens of the city of St. Louis. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. Good morning. Thank you for having us, and I, I believe that we'll be able to share some valuable inf information with you this morning. Um, the judge mentioned that I, I've brought along um, my deputy chiefs. Um, first is um, uh, Colonel Jones. She's the commander of the Central Patrol Bureau. Colonel Robinson is the commander of the North Patrol Division, and Colonel Layshock is the commander of the South Patrol Division. I might add that um, between us, you know, matter of fact, uh, Colonel Robinson is the youngest. He's right at 30 years, but our combined um, average experience is uh, 30 years on the department. So thank you for that. So I, I think I want to talk about the most serious uh, violent crime first, and then we'll work our way down. But uh, I think you'll, some of it will come uh, as very interesting to you. So the judge mentioned that we were um, uh, six homicides down, so we are at 152 homicides year to date. This time last year, we had 158. We can tell you that through investigation that at least 50% of these are drug related, 35% are personal vendetta, and 15% are domestic. Now, uh, on September the 22nd, the judge mentioned, we were down 25 homicides citywide. That's, on, that's less than a month ago. We were down 25 homicides. September 23rd, we had six homicides in 24 hours, five of which indicated were drug related. From September 23rd through today, we have had 28 homicides. Based on the indicators, we've determined that 13 involve narcotics, four are domestic, and seven are based on personal vendetta. Of course, there are some that are undetermined right now, but that's what we know at this point. In these 28, we've made 13 arrests and have one person wanted. Also, through investigation, we have determined that all but three of these involve persons who are acquainted with one another. Eleven have occurred in District 5. Nine have occurred in District 2. I'm sorry, yeah, nine, in, nine in District 2, uh, two in District 4. I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. Eleven have occurred in District 5. Nine in District 6 two in District 4, four in District 3, and two in District 1. That is accurate. Those homicides have occurred across 19 neighborhoods citywide. So 19 neighborhoods were affected by that. Citywide, we are down a, certainly a number that, I, that I'm certainly want to, want to emphasize. We're down 208 aggravated assaults citywide. Uh, specifically, assaults with firearms, we're down, aggravated assaults with firearms, we're down 88. We, citywide, we're down 262 robbers. That's a 19% decrease from this time last year. Citywide, the judge might have mentioned, violent crime is at a 10% deficit. So compared to this time last year, person crime overall is down 10%. 
citywide if you add um, uh, if, you, if you add theft and, and the other 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 nonviolent crimes, it's uh, citywide total crime is down uh, three percent. But I am focusing on violent crime, and that is down ten percent. We've recu we've recovered two thousand eighty five guns year to date. Um, basic strategy, of course, and I mentioned this earlier in the year, uh, enforcement on open-air drug markets, uh, specifically in the rectangle. Uh, we've added uh, a bunch of LPR systems, technological solutions, particularly in North St. Louis where we haven't had um, surveillance in the past. And then we are, we are very much relying on our relationship with the Better Family Life and the Urban League for our community engagement. Um, I, uh, just, just to give you an example, as far as de-escalation, um, and our partnership with Better Family Life and our gang intervention officers. Uh, there have been su 53 successful de-escalations. Those are persons that were, were dead set on hurting each other until there could be some resolution, and our working along with Better Family Life has actually prevented that. Uh, uh, the Save Our Sons program for the Urban League is another organization we work very closely with. Of course, they would boast uh, several hundred graduations of persons steering them out of, life to, of lifestyles that are particularly violent. Um, aggravated assaults with weapons, I already mentioned, were down 11 percent. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, now I'm going to move a little bit into the rectangle. So that was citywide. And so the, the whole strategy that I mentioned earlier on is that if we, could, if we could focus our attention on some of the most violent, cons persistently violent areas in the city, that that would have an impact citywide. And, so, and certainly that, that strategy is, is continuing to work. So in the rectangle specifically, and I've already mentioned to you in the past, that that's between Goodfellow and Vanderventer East and West, is between Dr. King and West Florence North and South. So in that rectangle, um, homicides are down by 13, which is a 19% decrease. Robberies are down by 38, which is a 16% decrease. Inside of the rectangle, aggravated assaults with weapons are down by 62, which is 11% decrease. And total crime, total violent crime down in our most persistently, most violent area of the city is down 13%. We have a newly formed uh, uh, drug enforcement and intervention unit. They have seized over a half a million dollars in street value of various drugs. For example, 50 pounds of marijuana, of seven, eight, eight pounds of methamphetamine, and, they have ex and our SWAT unit has ex executed 150 search warrants. Uh, we have task force officers assigned to the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, the FBI, and the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. We work closely with the US, U.S. Attorney's Office in those uh, partnerships. We are part of a current part of a, a carjacking task force. You know, there even, and I, I, I would like to mention even even with that uptick in, in carjackings that we saw a few weeks ago, that the number that I mentioned earlier, that we were down um, uh, citywide uh, 262 robberies, that includes the uptick that we had in, in carjackings and other robberies. Task force includes federal partners I mentioned earlier, but it also includes St. Louis County, neighboring munis, how the Missouri Highway Patrol, the Illinois State Highway Patrol, and the um, East St. Louis Police Department. They're all part of a carjacking task force where we track carjackings regionally. Uh, we monitor the activity of some 48 chronic violent juvenile offenders, 11 of whom are in custody. We work closely, I already mentioned we work closely with the Better Family Life, and we have a police athletic league, which, which we again try to steer, uh, be mentors, and try to keep kids out of uh, risky behavior. There are 35 coaches involved with PAL. There's 740 kids involved with baseball, basketball, softball, soccer, dance, track, and boxing. So again, that's, that's kind of an overview. The judge mentioned that we're going to come back up and be willing to answer questions. I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Colonel Layshock. He's going to give you a report on the South Patrol Division. Good morning. Just thought that uh, I would talk a little bit about our strategies in South Patrol covering the first and second districts. I have roughly um, 230 patrol officers, 45 sergeants, close to 20 lieutenants, two captains, and myself. Um, obviously, the district responsibilities, are our first and biggest responsibility is calls for service to get to them as fast as possible and then to try to work through anything that uh, we are called for so that uh, um, 
we can the help the citizens that have called us on that. And then we also obviously react to information that we get at neighborhood meetings, uh, which all of you attend most of the time. But when it comes to strategies dealing with violent crime, robberies, and s serious felonies, um, in, in districts one and two, um, intelligence gathering is one of the most important things that we do. Um, I'm lucky that I have a staff and my detective sergeants that are able to do a lot of research using some of the tools that we have, such as Crime Matrix, looking for links between people suspected in these felonies. And um, quite honestly, uh, one of the big tools is working with uh, Facebook posts and seeing the incredible links that unless you're really jumping into the Facebook dialogue that's going on, especially scarily enough, between people between the ages of 15 to, to their early 20s, we have compiled a list that the entire department has, my uh, comrades have certainly, that um, we're up to about 60 links primarily focused on people doing carjackings, and it is absolutely incredible how some crimes that w we've uh, uncovered on the south side have uh, sprung up with relationships to gangs in North County, Florissant, through people doing crimes all the way out to St. Charles. And um, therein lies the, the biggest challenge, is trying to um, enforce and catch people in the act. Um, as you know, some of our carjackers are adept at using masks and gloves. It hurts when we do make an arrest for our victims to be able to identify them, which is a key ingredient in getting it to court. But we have had success with that, but I feel like uh, one of the most important things is that we, that we have an intelligence base so we have a pretty good idea of who we are dealing with. Um, we have non-fatal shooting teams in both the first and second district. And uh, I brought uh, some statistics from January 1st up to today. In the first district, more south of the second, uh, we have cleared up 47 of our uh, shooting cases and uh, um, we've recovered 12 guns on, on those arrests. Um, but more importantly, uh, we have another squad that concentrates mostly on trying to seize firearms from convicted felons. And that crew, since January 1st, have seized 93 firearms with close to 100 arrests, and 26 of those people arrested were um, convicted felons. And when I, when I mention that, I have to tell you, I, I've been a policeman for 39 years. I've never seen the partnership between our police department and the U.S. Attorney's Office to be as strong as it is right now with instant um, try, trying to get defendants in front of a federal judge. Uh, we, we had a case uh, last Monday on a suspected uh, carjacking and a business robbery where within four hours of actually physically arresting the subject, he was in front of a federal judge and uh, federally complained. That is, uh, that is a big aid. Um, he'll be off the street until, till literally, until it goes to trial. And Jeff Jensen at the U.S. Attorney's Office has really, um, he comes to a lot of our meetings, has really encouraged his attorneys to come to our roll calls. We had uh, U.S. attorneys at our roll calls for three of the roll calls last week. And as I'm talking to you right now, there's an FBI agent back in our detective bureau on one particular case that we're working. So the, the partnership is a real plus for us, and I think it's going to make a big difference. In the second district, I, uh, I ran some information up to, until 9 o'clock this morning. We have 44 arrests of convicted felons with 70 firearms and one uh, pipe bomb seized. So they've been doing a very good job, and I think that that's one of the reasons where our crime is uh, down in the uh, second district and up slightly in the first district. Uh, and I guess the last thing I would just tell you is um, one of the most important things that we do on the south side, at, at talk at our roll calls, our leadership meetings, is when we have to shift resources to maybe Bevo 
or to Shaw, wherever all of a sudden there's an uptick in burglaries or robberies, whatever it is, uh, I think we're pretty nimble and pretty adept at shifting those resources, flooding those neighborhoods with visibility to try to um, stop whatever it is that's going on and make arrests. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Chief Hayden introduced me earlier, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Rochelle Jones, and I am the Deputy Chief from the Central Patrol Division, and basically that's your downtown area. Um, some of the challenges that we have, I've got three topics here. It's homeless, the homeless population. Thank you, ma'am. It's the homeless population, uh, the garage break-ins, and the south side. And for those of you all that are visual, here's uh, the border lines of District 3 and District 4. If you're a visual person, I'm visual. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I have Captain Creaseman and Captain Cousins. Captain Creaseman is the commander of the 4th District and Captain Cousins is the commander of the 3rd District. And as you all know, the 4th District, which is the downtown area, is plagued, uh, or we have to deal with, our homeless population. Um, what Captain Creaseman does, she has a sergeant and there's about four officers that it is their job to uh, work with our homeless population. And some of you all may be familiar with the group Homeful. They are uh, helping to manage the Biddle House. As some of you all know, uh, there was an issue with the homeless uh, being on the outside of the Biddle House. Uh, there were citizens that were trying to be helpful, but they were coming in giving them food and trying to give them clothing and do all of that, which uh, raises some health issues. So what Captain Creaseman has done, she has dedicated a sergeant and some officers, and they work very closely, and the captain does as well, with the homeless population. Uh, with the representatives and with the different uh, places that we have in the downtown area that uh, deal with our homeless population uh, and trying to give it a more positive spin and having something for the homeless folks to do to help, that'll help with your, our, the crimes and the crimes that they commit, I think. Our garages in uh, downtown area. As you know, there's like maybe 30 or 40 garages. And as you all know, that continues to be one of the challenges that we deal with in the 4th District. You have your larger areas like the Tom's Lot, the Stadium East, the Stadium West, and a lot of times uh, citizens leave weapons in their vehicles, and that is how some of the youngsters and some of the other uh, people obtain their weapons. What we do and what the detectives have done is they identify the prolific car thieves. And the detectives work, they take an extensive period of time and they work on that and they just gather up enough information to arrest the pro prolific car thieves and we've been able to arrest a few of them. We meet, the captains, we meet on a regular basis with the owners of the lots, but this is where the issue comes in. Some of the lots want security. Some of them are um, too cheap to get it, so they won't have security. Some of them hire security officers, but you get what you pay for. For example, there was one lot that had security, and the security officer heard car alarms going off. Now, instead of them going to, you know, look into it, they didn't, so the next morning, 20 cars had been broken into. So what we try to do, or what we do is we meet with the owners, um, we give them advice, uh, we talk about our real-time crime center, we talk about getting cameras, we talk about connecting them with, with our real-time crime center, we take them on tours of the real-time crime center, we talk about our successes, but it is all in what that owner wants to do. Um, and also the traffic, uh, especially in our, in the third district, we get complaints where citizens complain about people driving too fast or people going through um, 
stop signs. What we do or what the captains will do is they will have each, they have, there's areas, as you can see by the map, each car has an area. When the car is not on a specific directed patrol or handling an assignment, we ask that the cars go to that area. And, and first of all, if we receive a complaint, we let the officers know specifically what the complaint is. And we have them go to that area and uh, they may write tickets or whatever type of enforcement that they do. What Captain Cousins does is he will respond to whoever is making that complaint. He will uh, will do some enforcement and then he will respond. He'll either call them or he will send them a letter explaining specifically what we have done. And we also have our uh, traffic division who uh, we can ask for assistance from them, uh, you know, putting up a speed trailer or we can ask uh, I asked the commander of the traffic division to help us with enforcement if they can. But what you have to understand is the traffic division has a job that they have to do as well. They have to do uh, details and they have a lot of other different things that they have to take care of. But when they can, they do assist us. And the last thing I would like to talk about, uh, Colonel Layshock talked about his non-fatal team. The Central Patrol has one as well. We had, we had two sergeants, but one of the sergeants uh, was moved. So we have one sergeant and we have several officers and what they do specifically is if there is an assault and that means that someone may be shot or stabbed or beaten and they don't die. Um, what they do is they specifically investigate that. And that is very important because with a lot of the assaults, there's a retaliatory part to that and we don't want retaliation because safe your brother gets shot and you want to go out and you want to handle it yourself that non-fatal assault team is is out there they are specifically investigating those types of incidents and that means that they don't have to go and investigate anything that's going on in the district and that will assist with uh, retaliation and possibly another homicide or another assault. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Ronnie Robinson. I'm the commander of the North Patrol Division. And as you guys know, historically in the city of St. Louis, uh, North St. Louis has been, we've had ex experienced a lot of violence relative to uh, North Patrol. Uh, so our main focus and the chief's main focus was trying to decrease that violence that has been happening in our communities in North St. Louis for a long period of time. Uh, fortunately, at this time right now, uh, North Patrol will experiencing decreases in all crime categories relative to uh, our efforts and police efforts and collaborations. Uh, at this point in time, we're experiencing a 20% decrease in homicides in North St. Louis. I wish that number could be higher, but we're, we're focusing on making that number higher. And uh, a lot of that is due to our strategies relative to intervention and consistent pressure and contact with individuals that are involved in criminal activity, especially young, young people, young individuals that live in the communities. Uh, I got a gang intervention unit that we created in North St. Louis that uh, is very, very busy relative to their interactions in the community and uh, the movement of individuals that are involved in gang activities. This unit, what they do on a daily basis, they go not only into the communities, but they also visit the high schools or the volatile schools, starting at middle school and high schools in our community in uh, North Patrol to identify individuals that are getting involved in criminal activity at an early age. We focus on a lot of prevention relative to these guys not becoming career criminals and not being in our system and trying to keep them out of our system uh, as much as we can as far as uh, 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 our, criminal, our crime in the city of St. Louis is concerned. Um, uh, both districts are de uh, experiencing decreases in total crime uh, with district uh, 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 five and six and uh, every crime category with the exception of larceny, which is basically flat uh, across North Patrol. Uh, we've uh, also, uh, uh, as far as property crime is concerned, we know violence is the only thing that's happening in North Patrol. We focus a lot on property crime also. And uh, we've created a, a self-initiated initiative on night patrol uh, where we've increased building checks and business checks of, and checks of businesses at nighttime. And we're seeing triple digit 
decrease increases in self-initiated activity amongst the officers that are on the night patrol, which we're experiencing less business robberies at nighttime and business burglaries at nighttime. And uh, I think that's a very positive strategy because also it gets buy-in from a night and our, our night shift officers to keep them active, to be held accountable for their activity at nighttime when there's not a lot of movement in the community ex with the exception of burglary and business robberies. So I'm, we're very, I'm excited about that. Also, a holistic approach that we take in North St. Louis relative to building relationships in the community, as you all know, across the country, uh, the relationships between law enforcement and citizens, that relationship is strained. We've got a multitude of uh, initiatives relative to community engagement, uh, spearheaded by one of the most active captains relative to his philosophies and strategies relative to community engagement, Captain Perry Johnson in District 6, and also, uh, uh, that attitude is being infectious in District 5 with Captain Mike Mueller also. We've got uh, uh, initiatives and collaborations with state probation and parole with the GIE, with the gang intervention unit to reduce recidivism. Where well, we've done 59 home visits with convicted felons that are involved, these felons involved with dangerous weapons and uh, reducing uh, uh, the recidivism rate among those individuals. Uh, that, in, that intervention is being tracked and collaborated with UMSL University, University of Missouri St. Louis and Dr. Rosenfeld and uh, because of the statistics and the successes that they've had we applied for a national grant and was granted that money which will be used and go into operation for the, the program to continue in January. We will receive that funding from uh, uh, the National Institute of Justice relative to uh, their efforts. So hopefully I will be able to do, increase uh, home visits and interactions with convicted felons and so to stop the recidivism rate in our city. Um, also, uh, uh, their interventions, we've collaborated with the circuit attorney's office in some uh, programs and, and the chief mentioned Better Family Life with the de-escalation program. And to give you an example of a de-escalation, if we get uh, word of uh, a conflict involving weapons or a threat on someone's life, uh, the unit, the gang unit will collaborate and work with the workers, the street workers, the street team from fam Better Family Life and go meet, talk to the family members, the friends and try to find out what the conflict is all about and get in the midst of it so that there's no retaliation or there's no assaults to occur relative to that conflict. And if we have to do witness protection or movement or help Better Family Life with moving an individual out of the community, we'll assist with that. Also with the Demetrius Johnson Foundation, we've done some collaborations as far as uh, jobs are concerned and individuals that we, that we, co that we uh, encounter on the streets that are looking for employment instead of a life of criminal activity. We assisted those individuals with getting employment and we've been successfully able to get 59 people, what, excuse me, 58 people jobs relative to getting them off the streets and not being involved in criminal activity. Building relationships is uh, uh, very important to uh, our agency and uh, uh, a holistic approach to policing. As people say, we can't arrest our way out of this situation as far as violent crime is concerned, and that is definitely true. So therefore, you have to get out in the community and consistent interaction with the community is a, a vital, vital element of our strategy in North Patrol. Also, uh, uh, just uh, some of the examples of some of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, intervention uh, or community engagement uh, initiatives. We got a park, park and walk initiative in one of the most volatile areas in the city where the officers get out of their cars and for at least an hour or so they walk the community and do foot beats in those communities in those problem areas and get to know the individual, even knock on doors to get to know the citizens in those communities uh, in those dangerous wards. We've had a lot of interaction uh, uh, with some of the, all the people that sit on this board and they're very concerned about uh, their wards and uh, Miss Boyd being one of them and uh, she has a problem area of 4900 block of Plover. We've spent an, an extensive time in that 4800, 4900 block of Plover and we will continue those efforts as far as our interactions up there to try to curb that crime and stop those complaints that are coming from citizens in that area. Uh, it's just, it's, it's just uh, uh, we suffer as you all know with manpower issues, but these officers are diligently and professionally doing their jobs. And just an example, the chief mentioned our seizure of over 2,000 weapons, 2,085 weapons, illegal guns on the street. Well, 
uh, in District 6, we've seized 522 of those weapons, and in District 5, 366 of those weapons off of dangerous individuals in those communities, and uh, we haven't had or what you have a problem or protest or controversial shooting relative to those seizures, and these officers are doing their job, like I said, professionally and, and protecting the community. We've had some controversy, but those controversies uh, I'm sure uh, uh, that are still being investigated, you will see that the officers are acting with good faith. And I'm proud of those officers and the jobs that they're doing. Uh, but uh, enforcement, along with intervention and interaction is what we need, and developing relationships is our most important mission as far as uh, our agency is concerned. Thank you. Alderman Kennedy, you've heard and this committee has heard uh, a lot of information, uh, a lot of positive information, but um, I just want to step back and let you know that uh, it hasn't all been, been good in the city of St. Louis. If you have been a victim of violence in the city of St. Louis, uh, your, your family can care less about what the numbers are. And we're very empathetic and we, we empathize with everyone who has been a victim in the city of St. Louis. Every time there is violence in the city of St. Louis, I agonize and I ask lots of questions about how can we, how can we do better. I talk to the chief regularly. I talk to our federal partners, the FBI, the ATF, the U.S. Marshals, the DEA, the DEA as well as the United States Attorney often about uh, crime in the city of St. Louis. You heard a lot of discussion about weapons being seized, over 2,000 weapons seized. As you know, uh, from my introduction, there are no gun laws in the state of Missouri anymore. And because of that, we have had to rely on the federal court and the United States Attorney accepting those cases and having those cases indicted uh, at the federal level. The federal court uh, has now taken over 900 gun cases that would have otherwise been prosecuted in the state court in the city of St. Louis. We have no gun laws as it relates to juveniles. So we've had to, to be smart about how we address those. So we've had meetings with the attorney for the juvenile officer, and we have determined that the best way to address juveniles in possession of weapons is to deal with it under the behavior injurious to a child statute that allows us to take the, the gun away from the juvenile. It does not allow us, however, to arrest the juvenile. So at this time, uh, we will accept uh, any questions uh, that you might have with respect to crime in the city of St. Louis. First of all, let me thank you very much for the, uh, all the information and the statistics. Uh, if you have, we could, I think it would help the committee if we had some of that in, in writing, if you could get that to us, and I could distribute it out to the rest of the committee. It would be very helpful. Uh, once, once again, thank you. We will entertain questions from members of the committee. Would you please excuse Alderman Vaccaro? Mm -hmm. um, we'll first take Alderman Boyd. Thank you. Uh, appreciate seeing everybody here. A lot of, a lot of power in the room. Uh, Judge, you always do a uh, good job at covering all angles. But something struck out. To, um, I mean, you talk about maybe some legislation about mandatory sentencing. And you know that kind of strikes a chord with, with, with people going back to, of course, the Clinton administration and mandatory sentencing as, as it relates to drugs. If we had mandatory sentencing for someone who shot somebody, based on the circumstance of how it may have happened, wouldn't that kind of restrict the judge of having no choice but to That. Currently, we have a mandatory minimum of three years in the Missouri Department of Corrections without the possibility of probation or parole for all armed criminal actions. What I am suggesting that the mandatory minimum not be three, but be 15 and 25 respectively. These are people who have shot or used a gun to harm people, to injure folk 
or to kill people. It has nothing to do with the underlying offense like homicide or the underlying offense of assault. And so what I'm hoping to amend is the mandatory, currently the mandatory armed criminal action count. And armed criminal action counts have been uh, within the discretion, quite frankly, of prosecutors. I've had a discussion with some legislatures. I've had a discussion uh, with our prosecutor in the city of St. Louis. Now, uh, I can't speak for her, uh, but there has not been a whole lot of pushback with respect to this issue. We have no gun laws. We have people that are being injured every day by guns, and we have uh, uh, no truth in sentencing. So truth and sentencing, in my mind, is dealing with the, the gun violence. My biggest problem in the city of St. Louis is the proliferation of guns. If there are no guns in the city of St. Louis, I don't have this problem. It's the proliferation of guns, and it's what I am trying to deter. And so what I want the offender, the person with that gun, to think about the consequences. People commit crimes based upon, uh, based upon risk and reward. What I would like to do is put some teeth in our law and to have this law to address risk and consequences. And the consequences must be significant enough uh, that I am somewhat deterred or maybe will pause and think about my actions. And so, so the, the solution, I believe, this legislative solution that I am uh, uh, offering and hope that we're able to have some serious discussion about has nothing to do with the underlying crime. It has everything to do with the use of a weapon to harm and or murder uh, people. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chief, I want to ask you, kind of go back and talk a little bit about since September 23rd, 28 homicides, correct? That is correct. And it's been 13 arrests, I think, of what I heard you say. That is correct. On that. That's an astounding number in a short period of time. Any idea of what, where that came from? I mean, is 75% connected? They all knew each other. Is it a game issue going on? What, how did that happen? Yes, sir. So basically what we've uh, determined in those 28 um, uh, 13, like I said, you know, there's there's three or four. Let's say what that's uh, three or four, uh, three or four that are undetermined, but 13 involve narcotics. And when I say involve narcotics, there's either uh, narcotics in and about the scene, strewn about the scene, or information from witnesses that would tell you, hey, that was a drug deal. That was, um, you know, we talk to people, that's a drug deal that was going on. Hey, this person carries uh, has ten thousand dollars on their person at all times. That, it's that kind of information that allowed us to determine that. So. Of those 28, 13 involved narcotics, four were domestic, and, you, and some, of, some of the domestic ones, I think there's been quite a bit of publicity around, and then seven are personal vendetta. When I say personal vendetta, I'm referring to cases that we know who did it like right away. So we, we'll, we'll get to the scene and say, hey, Johnny was mad at, at him, or Johnny owned him some money, or what have you. Johnny shot um, Jerry. All right, but are these kind of like isolated individual incidents, or is it a group of people you shot my brother, so I'm going to shoot you, and so on. And so yes, sir. Forth. There was there was not a, a lot of retaliatory okay. involvement. In fact, um, if you go back a couple of weeks to ones up at Hamilton Heights, the, I, I think there occurred one one right behind the other, and sh surely people thought it immediately. I know I did. Uh, hey, man, this is what's going on. Is there a bunch of retaliation shootings there? All three or four of those were we we made an arrest in all three or four, but they were all actually individual incidents. And all three of we made well. I'm, I'm, I'm going on Blackstone. There's an arrest. There's an arrest on Dr. King. There was an arrest, and I think there's and there's one wanted person. Three arrests and one wanted person out of those four. That's encouraging. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that was a pretty bad night. To Absolutely, a bad bad night for us all. But like I said, um, <coughs> uh, uh, we it, it, the one that was wanted. You know, as soon as we got there, person said who 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 did the shooting right away. Um, one one person was taken in custody on the scene. I think on Blackstone. Then the Dr. King. And the other one were, uh, um, I think the belt were. Uh, Blackstone was self-defense. Blackstone was self-defense. Okay. Yeah. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the carjackings. It sounds like the data that you gave us, the carjackings was included in a larger category. So That's correct. We've been hearing that there's this uptake on carjackings. 
talk a little bit more. What, what's going on with carjackings? Um, why is it an uptake? And what are we actually doing again? Kind of. Sure. So, so probably, I guess, uh, maybe a month or so ago, some, uh, some, some pretty high-profile um, uh, carjacks occurred. I'm going I'm to let, um, let Colonel Layshock fill me in because he can talk a little bit about the arrest. But the point is, is that what we, what we, what we did to address it was we, for, we, the, a task force was already formed, but we met more regularly. And like I said, the task force includes the St. Louis City Police, St. Louis County Police, the Highway Patrol, Illinois State, East St. Louis, and a bunch of neighboring uh, municipalities. So I, I'm going to let Colonel Layshock kind of elaborate because I, I, he actually spearheaded the robbery detail and like I said, we had some really good results from that. So Alderman, uh, could you come over to the, to yeah, the microphone? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. I don't need it because it's pretty big. Maybe it's the mic. The mic's not on. Okay. This mic's not on. I heard you. Uh, no, that's good. Uh, also, besides everything else that the chief said, also we really have had a lot of help from agents from the FBI and the ATF with this. So um, we challenged uh, my staff and working with the anti-crime task force and even the chief's new mobile reserve to um, study, again, this uh, Facebook nexus. And we could not believe the links that we had, again, between groups in North County coming into Southside. We, we've had a gang that we've really had to do a lot of work with called the Pressure Gang, which is uh, primarily based uh, in the area of uh, Keokuk, Compton, that little area. But we knew that they were going out and doing robberies out in North County and also uh, uh, due to some of where the carjack cars in the city were ending up up in North County. But I would tell you that within about 12 or 13 days, we cleaned up four or five armed carjackings, recovered the cars, and have close to 12, 13 people in custody, some juveniles, and all of a sudden that wave uh, immediately dropped off. And so we've had a couple of isolated ones, uh, carjackings, and really uh, a couple that uh, Colonel Robinson had, we were talking to his detectives, not even completely sure those were bona fide incidents. So we've made some headway there. Our list that we have out with pictures and the links are up to about 62 young people. And again, between the ages of 15 and 22, dangerous. But uh, right now, we have some key people in custody, and that's kind of where we stand with it. We've made some big headway. So, uh, what what percentage are we down since you did all that good work? I mean, the past 30 days, have it made a significant impact? Oh, You've it, just seen it. Incredible. I mean, we were averaging uh, one or two good carjackings a night, and then all of a sudden, uh, we, we sometimes you make that one key arrest. Uh, within two particular nights, three weekends ago, we got two carjack cars, and right from those alone with those subjects and who they were linked to, it spread into a couple more carjacking arrests. Uh, we've got some wanted's out on some people. It, it really, but you you just have to keep at it. Um, it we, the uh, communications between our agency and St. Louis County and some of the surrounding municipalities on the west side of St. Louis, we've really been sharing a lot of information, and it's it's making sense and it's helping us. And Alderman, just to add, so in, so in, included in that number, in spite of the, the spike, so we're citywide, we're down 262 robberies, and that's a 19% deficit from this time last year. Okay. Thank you. Um, highway Patrol, is Highway Patrol still partnering with us on the highways, uh, or? The um, Highway Patrol um, is not uh, partnering to the degree that I would like to see them partner with us. I've had a conversation with Governor Parsons uh, to see if we can revisit the Highway Patrol uh, to do more and better work on Highway 70, 64, uh, and 44 and 55. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, they will uh, recommit uh, their resources uh, back in the city of St. Louis. And so uh, I cannot give you a definitive answer with respect to the Highway Patrol at this time. Okay, I'm down to two last questions. Mm -hmm. One's uh, a trivial question. Do we still have majors? Yes. We do. 
Okay, are they the patrols, like North Patrol Service? No, or? most of them are in our special, specialized services, and so hey, I, don't, I don't know if, I, I think I, I was here at some point, but I mentioned that I was going to, hey, the, the, hey the, this right here is the A-team. So I knew that we coming into this year, we were, we were like I said, we had 200, 205 homicides. We were, we were really uh, being challenged, arguably, uh, crisis mode with respect to uh, violent crime. And so I, I, I asked my deputy chiefs to go out there and replace the majors um, until we get things under control. And certainly they've done an excellent job thus far this year, and I really hope to, as, as we close the end of the year out, that that, that number would even um, uh, be bettered. Okay, so here's, here's uh, one of the hardest questions. So how are we doing with solving these murders and personal attacks, percentage-wise? Out of 200 some murders, what percentage have we seen? So we, we, I, I would say we, we have a rolling 50% of clearance rate. So our clearance rate is 50%. Hey, uh, yeah, you might have seen myself and um, um, the circuit attorney on television over the weekend. Hey, we could, we could solve them all with, with some help. So it's certainly, um, we still continue to beg folks to share information with Crime Stoppers. Very challenging, and so and even the, even the high-profile um, um, uh, murder conviction that we celebrated. Hey, at the end of the day, it was a long time before people came forward on that Walnut Park East shooting. I mean, so it, it, we we think it's kind of a given that people will share everything they know. People are very concerned about retaliation. It's just a, a, a constant work in progress. Is that a static 50% over the past several years? Absolutely. That's a stat, that, that is a stat, that's kind of a rolling 50%. Okay. Yes, sir. I thought it was, I was down to my last, but here's my last question. Okay. It's, it's kind of like that warm and fuzzy that people like to feel. So in, in the neighborhood, we have these quality of life issues. They're the low level, you know, it's not a shooting. It's not, people are driving past stop signs, blowing red lights. I mean, just this small stuff that's a nuisance, but still, affect our quality of life psychologically. Absolutely. It's like you can just do whatever you want to do in these neighborhoods. We have these public affairs officers. Are they truly dedicated to just serving these neighborhoods? Or they're doing a lot of the errands and stuff, you know, that's incidental to really getting involved with the constituents, getting to know Miss Jones, Mr. Jones, maybe have a cup of coffee every now and then so that we can bridge that gap between the citizens. The Absolutely. In, in, in each case, uh, Alderman, those persons are handpicked. Those are the persons with the, with the type of personalities that will be conducive for success in those areas. And so, you know, every, everyone can speak about, hey, they're, they're, there's officers, they're, they're person, their personality, their communication skills are conducive to really um, um, the warm, fuzzy, making um, uh, neighborhood partners feel comfortable going out of their way to do some things. And, we, and I, so anecdotally, we have some very good examples of that. And they do come out to the, the meetings. I mean, I, I appreciate having them. I would hate to ever see them go away, but it just, maybe we just need more of them. Um, Perhaps. I'm very interested in figuring out how we bridge that gap so we can solve more crime yes, sir. in our neighborhood. And hey, it's driving us nuts, you know, running stop signs, running red lights. It's almost like anything goes. And I would like to see us do something to be able to deal with that particular issue. Absolutely, absolutely. So I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Alderman Onerwitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everybody, for showing up today. Um, I mean, there's no doubt we still have a ton of work to do in this city. Um, uh, I, I do believe that we need more uh, intervention with, with the younger kids and maybe going back t to the grade school, uh, you know, 12 and 13 years old, uh, if we can get some intervention in schools and get them into different activities such as boxing, sports and all that. But, you know, where do we, you know, we need help with money to do these programs. And, and I would think that the state would want to reach out and help, you know, with some efforts. So maybe we need to have a, a a dialogue with them and helping. Um, um, I have actually noticed and haven't heard on the news much in the last few weeks about carjacking, yes, to be honest with you. Um, so, I mean, things have, you know, you can show things have gone down, but I think it's just everybody concentrates on the homicides. And unfortunately, I think the bottom line is we can't stop them from happening unless you happen to be right there, somebody calls and 
maybe here's something that you you can intervene. I, I think the police department does the best job they can with the tools that they have. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I had made a statement that the, the, the last neighborhood meeting I went to, crime was up 27%, but it wasn't no violent crimes. It was car break-ins, things like that. But then you hear the same old story, oh, I left the laptop in my car, or I had a gun in the car. <clears throat> and unfortunately, that's why people's checking cars to get these to get guns and that they're on the streets and one gun might be responsible for one or two killings. Um, so I mean, we need the citizens to be a little more responsible at the same time. And I know a lot of times you can't get things out because it's hard to get people to come forward and be a witness because they're scared. You know, but I, I just wish that they would learn to get together. And I think if they did and start doing it, <clears throat> people would say, we got to get out of this neighborhood because they're starting to ban up against us now. So, but I will say, uh, I think the police department does the best job they can with what they have to work with. Um, I, you know, and I'm, I agree with the director Edwards. I, I think, you know, maybe the answer is you know, getting tougher on some of these sentencing. Uh, some kids, I mean, you know, you, you try to help them and after the second, third time, you know, most likely they're not gonna turn around, which is unfortunate. Um, so maybe it's time, you know, we do get a little tougher on some sentencing. We don't want to, but, you know, maybe that could be the answer, maybe it couldn't be the answer. I don't know. I. Um, which I certainly know by carjackings. Uh, three years ago, my wife pulled up and they, uh, was it a, an attempt at carjacking. So three males with guns surrounded her. Luckily, she was just smart enough to hit the accelerator and lucky. But yes, I, I mean, whatever we can do, and I do see the police on the streets talking with citizens and, you know, I think we have a great police department. Do we have a few bad apples? Yeah, it's like it's everywhere else, but I think we're getting rid of them. But the most important thing to me is we need to get the circuit attorney's office to work together with the police department because, you know, you hear these things at this, that, and everything else. So I don't know where she gets her information from, but, you know, we need to get straight on work together. There's been a wedge driven between the police department and the circuit attorney's office, which never helps. Yes, sir. So, so, so uh, Judge Edwards, we, uh, Kim Gardner and I met uh, a couple of weeks back, and we have um, certainly um, done a lot more things to make sure that the agencies work better together. I so said we, we, we were together this past Friday, uh, like I said, again, talking about, uh, uh, talking about a case that we felt that our collaborative efforts was was part of the success. We're going to sit down on on. Matter of fact, we're going to take a look at some um, some other ones, and so we'll see if we can have some of the same successes that we've had on uh, particularly homicides. As, like I said, that's that's the most violent crime that we have. But no, we are we're working better together. Hardiman, let me just uh, assure you uh, that we understand that that uh, it is important that the prosecutor office works with the police department, and the police department works effectively with the prosecutor office. We are making sure that that happens. In fact, this continuum of the criminal justice system is dependent upon one another. But more importantly, uh, the, police off, the police department will have no success unless the community helps the police. The community needs the police, and the police needs the community. That's important, and so, what people might be thinking in terms of relationships. We have, we've closed, in, we've closed that wedge and we're, we're working effectively, uh, respectfully, and making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of public safety in the city of St. Louis. Thank you, uh, Alderman. And thank you, I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Hubbard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, and I definitely thank you all uh, for coming down here. I know you all have a hard job to do, and sometimes you aren't rewarded as much as you should be for your uh, efforts. But I just have a comment and then a few questions. 
specifically to Judge Edwards. Um, have you spoken with anyone uh, regarding amending the, uh, the ACA? And I just asked that because when you mentioned it, I'm definitely uh, concerned about it because in the past, I mean, even if you go back as far as like the crime bill of 94, we, we know that like some of those strategies didn't really work and it caused an adverse effect in our communities. And we had many people serving a lot of time in prison and they didn't get rehabilitated or anything. So, um, and you're dealing with a group of people who aren't rational to begin with. So I'm not sure if that would exactly serve as a deterrent, but have you put any feeders out there to see what type of support we could get legislatively for something like that on the uh, state level? The, the answer is yes. Uh, I am not concerned uh, necessarily with uh, the low level uh, matters. I'm not concerned with possession of drugs. I'm not even concerned with, with robberies uh, without a weapon. What I'm concerned about is when people actually shoot folk and assault folk or when people kill folk. And then when we take a look, then that person is a recidivist. We have about a 30% recidivism problem in our state. And so we have to we have to fix that. And so this amendment has really nothing to do with the underlying offense. What this amendment does is it raises an already three-year minimum for armed criminal action. It raises it from a three-year minimum to the 15 and 25-year respectively. And so if you are bold enough and you intend we have to have mens reas, actus reas, and corpus delecti, the parts of a crime. If you intentionally shoot and hurt someone, you ought to be held responsible. I'm not talking about the mentally ill. I'm not talking about self-defense. I'm talking about those people that intend to hurt innocent people, people that, that kill folk. If it's a murder first, you're going to the penitentiary for the rest of your life without probation or parole anyway on a murder first. On a murder second, it's 10 to 30 alive. But always with those crimes or the attendant required by law, armed criminal action charge. So I'm looking at the armed criminal action charge as the consequence with respect to to these crimes. And so you can actually get probation on a murder second. You can't get it on a murder first. So if you can get probation on the underlying murder second, what I'm concerned about is you're going to be walking our streets again. So I'm putting the armed criminal action and making it a mandatory minimum because there's only one statute that needs to be changed as opposed to a lot of statutes. And so I think it has no impact. And I was very familiar, of course, with the amendment of the, of the crime code and, the, and our criminal statutes in the state of Missouri. I think what this does is it has an impact only on shooters. It has no impact on any other type of offender, only on those uh, with intent. We don't have malice and a forethought anymore, but who coolly reflected upon the shooting before they do it. I mean, we, we have to address and let folk know that we are serious about you committing these gun offenses in the city of St. Louis. Okay, and I know in the um, past when you were here, you mentioned about uh, speaking with someone in the legislature specifically about if, because we basically have no gun laws, um, have they tried to do anything uniquely just for St. Louis and Kansas City so that we can try to address some of the issues that we're having? I offered that suggestion to Governor Parsons. Uh, you, you know, he said he would consider it. I was, of course, with our, our mayor, Mayor Lyda Cruson, and with uh, the mayor over in Kansas City, Sly James. Uh, we, we have a problem in the urban areas in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect, uh, to our rural legislatures. Uh, we don't shoot turkey and deer and duck with AR-15s and AK-47s in the city of St. Louis. Right. And so we have to address this problem. 
And if we don't address this problem from where I sit, then it's malfeasance, it's nonfeasance, it's negligence. We have a responsibility to the citizens of the city of St. Louis to fight for this change. Um, thank you for that uh, comment. I just was looking for a follow-up. And so um, the next question I have is uh, uh, regarding, this may be directed toward Mrs. Jones, regarding um, the homeless population downtown and um, uh, specifically uh, in the Car Square neighborhood where we have Biddle House. And I mean, we just had an incident last night with uh, Car School was caught on fire again. And I know I haven't spoken to anyone about it. This just happened at 12 o'clock last night. But in the past, those fires were due to the homeless population starting a fire inside the school. They would break into the school, start a fire, try to stay warm, and then the, build, the school would catch on fire and it would create a, um, a problem. Um, I know homelessness is an issue that we're dealing with as a city overall, but specifically in that area, what um, has been done to try to circumvent some of the, the problems that we have regarding homelessness, like in Loretta Hall Park, like um, in downtown by the McDonald's where there's an influx of homeless people around um, Biddle House. What have we done? Because that situation has definitely plagued that neighborhood. Now, well, one, as I talked about earlier, there's a new group called Homeful that specifically works with the Biddle House. Yeah, could you come over? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, they work specifically with the Biddle House. Uh, that's a group that has experience with working with the homeless. I have uh, a captain, Renee Creesman, that is very engaged and involved with the homeless. Uh, with the group, uh, she has a sergeant and she has some officers that that is their specific job. Um, earlier um, at the Biddle House, anyone that wanted to could come and give food and give clothes to the homeless. And that kind of was contrary to everything that was happening on the inside because everything is, they have a structure. Okay, so they don't do that now. Um, this summer we had uh in some of the parks there was food uh there was lunches that was specifically given out i just think uh being able to have a specific group which is kind of hard to do that because we're charged with we have a certain amount of people and there's uh, a lot of things that need to be done but we do have a sergeant and some officers that specifically deal with that part uh, in doing that, the sergeant and the officers get to know the staff, they get to know the people, the homeless people uh, that work there. So that's one of the things or some of the things that we are specifically doing with the homeless population. And I think uh, someone, one of the aldermen alluded to your quality of life. Now with them not standing on the outside, accepting sandwiches, accepting food, that helps with the health for health reasons and also with your smaller quality of life issues because what happens with those smaller issues they turn into bigger issues. you know first you're begging you're you in the at the McDonald restaurant you're begging begging turns into uh, pushing and shoving and maybe a robbery so uh, I think um, no I know having specific people dedicated to that specific issue is, a, is helpful. Thank you uh, for your efforts uh, in that regard. I mean, it's definitely an issue that's near and dear to me. I live right across the street from Loretta Hall Park and we've had a, a heavy saturation of the homeless population in that area. I mean, it, was, it has gotten so bad to the point where there was a book bag placed in my front door, inside my screen door and so many people had broken in apartments and stuff and units in that area. I mean, it was the homeless population and they, the management would have to run them out. But it was a situation where I was like, okay, I rarely use my front door, but had I not gone back a couple of times to see it, I don't know if they would try to break in or not. So that's definitely um, something that I think that uh, we probably should try to do a better job or just utilize whatever resources are available to address that. And um, lastly, um, can you tell me specifically what neighborhoods or what locations you all have the park and walk initiatives because we would definitely like to see that in neighborhoods in the fifth ward um specifically you are you talking about uh or down yeah we were doing that in the district go ahead go ahead district six we were doing it in the 21st ward okay. to the park and walk and other right. areas on west right. Right. come to the mic please 
recording oh. you guys in District 6, we were doing that initiative relative to the 21st Ward and other problem areas where uh, Captain Johnson was receiving all his complaints from where we were doing the park and walk. And also with another initiative, you know, culturally uh, in the communities in North St. Louis, a place of communication is the barbershops. As far as males are concerned, you can go to any barbershop, local barbershop, and strike up conversation with citizens that live all across the districts. And uh, we're doing an initiative there relative to policemen going going into the barbershops and talking with the young men that frequent the barbershops and, and males that live in the community, try to get them on board to be our extra eyes and ears. That's another initiative that we're doing relative to that. So uh, as far as engagement and building those relationships is very vital and moving forward. You know, the chief has just started his efforts relative to a heavy emphasis on engagement, and I think we'll see the dividends and be rewarded as we go along, and uh, these relationships will pay dividends in the future. I definitely um, appreciate that. Uh, I'm a big proponent of community policing. And I think sometimes if, if you know, people in the community just see you out more, I mean, because you can call the police and if they just simply ride by and kind of look on stuff, it's not the same as a person actually out there on foot. And, you know, I know that there's some issues, some safety concerns regarding that too, but I think that if we had more interaction in our community uh, with police officers, you know, walking up, just being um, cordial, I mean, having it to it's not a situation where there's always a bad interaction when something is going on so i think that would be good and i know it specifically in my neighborhood and, and a couple of people have called about it too we have businesses that are open to having police substations uh within the ward because they know that it can serve as a deterrent so um that's something i definitely would like to see more in our right. district and i have no and uh well ma'am i'd, I'd like to say something in reference to the issues that you talked about with homeless I would like to know if you called, if you talked with the supervisor, or if you talked with Captain Creaseman, if you had a discussion about your issues, and did they address your issues? Because for me, if I know better, I can do better. If, uh, if your issues are not being addressed, then Cap certainly Captain Creaseman, myself, we need to know about that so that we can address the issues because uh, as we all know the homeless is an issue in the central patrol that we constantly we're constantly working on it you know constantly partnering and constantly trying to deal with uh, the homeless population definitely um I, I appreciate that i haven't talked to captain creaseman uh specifically because i've been dealing with it on another level i mean i was a big uh, adversary to Biddle House opening. I mean, yes, there's currently a, a federal lawsuit with the city and HUD regarding the whole situation with Biddle House. I'm grateful that we do have a new operator to maybe address some of those issues, but mm -hmm. you, that homeless shelter was, was pushed into a neighborhood that has many challenges. I mean, it's a public housing, low income corridor, and that simply does not work when you add a homeless uh, component to that. But um, most specific issues, um, if I continue to see them, I definitely will reach out to uh, her. I, I have just been calling the police when certain incidents happen or whatever. And like the situation last night with the school, yes, everybody has been made aware of it. it. It has happened in the past. I mean, they were, the owners were constantly boarded up, but the homeless population would just filter into the building, trying to stay warm, start a fire, and then the building would be on fire. So. Okay, well then I'll be very specific with that. Uh, Captain Creaseman is away from her desk. However, Sergeant Nicole Gentilini, that is her job uh, with the officers. So when we're done here, I'll have a specific sidebar with you and I will ensure that Sergeant Gentilini gives you a call and uh, we can talk about what we need to do. And I'm just asking you in the future, like I said, if I know better, I can do better. And Captain Creaseman is certainly very uh, she engaged and involved with uh, the homeless population. Thank you. That completes you. Alderman Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, I want to start by just saying, you know, again, thank you, and just to say I have wonderful relationships with both of my captains. The seventh ward is in both the third and fourth district, uh, and, and I communicate with Captain Cousins and uh, Captain Creaseman regularly, and previously with Captain Dace when we had him in the third. Um, I've got a couple topics I want to cover, and I promise, Chairman, I won't take too long here. Uh, I want to first talk about something that Chief mentioned 
uh, and it has to go goes back to the homicide clearance rate, and it's something we all know is a problem, um, and no one ever seems to be able to come up with a solution. But and it it's it's fear of retaliation and it's witness cooperation. Um, you know, your clearance rate's fifty percent. Most of these crimes, somebody knows who did it, who the shooter is, uh, but no one will step forth. And that's been the case for years and years. It was the case when I worked in the prosecutor's office. It's still the case today, you know, four or five years later. I, I guess if we were working on improving our relationship with the circuit attorney's office and our federal partners, what are we doing to address this problem? Because it's what I see if you're going to tackle violent crime, you're going to have more success with trying to make these witnesses and victims feel safe than you are getting some of these guns off the street. So could you please talk more specifically about what we're doing uh, to ensure the safety of witnesses and victims of violent crime? Sure. So the one thing we've done, I, I, and matter of fact, there have even been some, um, some radio, some radio um, advertisements, or some public service announcements. So we've been, we've been really upping our um, um, encouraging folks to use crime stoppers a lot. And so, uh, albeit that doesn't necessarily, well, the, the, the mechanism, of course, is for you to be able to provide information anonymously and therefore avoid being a, a retaliatory uh, a target of some sort. So, so, so we've been, we, we've definitely been, we've, we've really increased our, our uh, radio time and, and our, our community engagement with respect to reminding people we've passed out when we go door to door a lot of times. Yeah. We pass out Crime Stopper information. So that's, so that's one thing. But well, let's start there then. So okay. you guys have given a lot of metrics. We're getting all sorts of stats today. So on Crime Stoppers, if we're increasing our radio buys and whatever else, are we seeing results? Are we, are we getting more tips? Are we giving out more rewards? Right. So, so uh, Lisa Pichotta would tell you that we've, we've probably increased our tips by 30 percent just probably in the last uh, three or four months. And so she is, she's definitely seeing the rewards. We're reaping the benefits of the contact. The other piece I would say is kind of sim similar to what the, um, the various colonels have mentioned. Hey, we, we also believe that part of it is, is persons' mistrust of the police department. And so, so Crime Stoppers is a way in which people can do it anonymously, but we do believe that our community engagement efforts are causing people to be a lot more uh, um, talkative around the police or a lot more trusting with information that they share with us. Okay. So that, yes, sir. But so that on the, on the Crime Stoppers part, and I think that's, that's great, and I think it would be good to see some more specific stats on what are our ad buys and the kind of results we're getting from that program. And frankly, if, if we're paying for advertising, I mean, I think that would be worthy of a partnership with local media to say, you know, we need your help. How about some discounted or free airtime yes, for please, this Yes, sir. Actually, it, it, to be quite honest with you, we actually don't have a budget for it. Most of that money is coming from the police foundation. Okay. Yes, sir. And I heard they were advertising on the radio last week. Um, so I guess anonymous tips are great. And they help maybe find a suspect, arrest somebody, but ultimately to assist a prosecution, you need somebody to show, possibly show up in court, in an open courtroom, and testify. So back to that question, what are we doing to ensure the safety of victims and eyewitnesses who are essential for prosecution? Right. So naturally, we, you know, we've all seen some, some large-scale or robust witness protection programs when you talk about on the federal level we don't have that on on the state level but what we do can't what we can do is that if there are specific threats against folks we can coordinate with the circuit attorney's office to make sure persons are safe but like I said but but insofar as some some uh, comprehensive uh, 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 witness protection program naturally we don't have the resources for that but we do work with them in order to if like I say you got a specific threat about a person we can we can certainly work with that um, they've uh, Better Family Life has helped getting folk in and out of town. In some instances, you want to add something? Right? Yes, 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 sir. And, and just recently, you read about the case, and the chief mentioned the triple homicide right. in Walnut Park, where the young girl was also severely injured uh, with a wound to her head. Uh, we just, they just completed that case and got a conviction with a one single eyewitness, and that, that eyewitness was protected by the GID, the, the gang intervention unit, throughout that process and working and collaborating with the circuit attorney's office. The chief has allowed us the autonomy to make those decisions and work with that office. So moving forward, hopefully we can be helpful to them anytime they get a severe threat and we have the opportunity to help them, we will do that. But that just occurred in that case last week. Okay, thank yeah. you, Lieutenant Let me just, uh, if I can just add, on to uh, um, Alderman, um, as, a, as a young prosecutor, I think you've tried cases in front of me over the years, and you know that uh, uh, we don't have uh, a major issue uh, with uh, witness tampering uh, in the city of St. Louis. Uh, there is a culture, however, uh, with respect to snitches get stitches and things of that sort. So I think that uh, the problem 
uh, um, is is uh, uh, it's is probably more presumed or assumed than it is in reality. Very seldomly do we have witness tampering or, or things that are impacting uh, victims after the case has been charged. Now, with that said, we understand that we have to support uh, the prosecutor, Kim Gardner, with respect to her her witness protection program, with respect to to victims and things of that sort. And so, our biggest problem is a culture change. And one of the reasons that we've gone to public service announcements uh, that are very targeted uh, uh, in certain communities uh, with certain radio stations, uh, iHeart. The family uh, has done a tremendous job of making sure that uh, every hour uh, that they're talking about stand up, changing the narrative, you have to call the police, you have to be supportive of the police. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to close that trust gap. If we can close the trust gap in the right communities, I think that uh, inevitably we will solve we will solve more crimes. So the I don't want the public to to infer from this discussion that we have a serious witness tampering problem in the city of St. Louis or that we have a serious victim retaliation problem in the city of St. Louis inside of the courthouse. Uh, in my 25 years as a circuit judge, I believe I've dealt with two of them. And so that gives you some idea of just how serious uh, uh, perhaps uh, when a quote or unquote uh, 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 is more the the unintended consequences are greater. Uh, it's just not happening in the city of St. Louis at this time. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys, you know, taking that issue seriously and the the work you're doing with Crime Stoppers and the foundation. And obviously, it doesn't fall exclusively on the police department um, to ensure you know the safety. And whether whether real or perceived issues, um, it's it's an ongoing problem. And you know, you mentioned it yourself. It's one of the biggest deterrents to getting that clearance rate for violent crime up, which is getting folks to cooperate. Um, okay, so we'll move on. If we could, uh, I'd like to talk about stolen guns and car break-ins, and I, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones touched on this. I mean, in downtown alone, this year, we've had, not, as of the end of September, 900 car break-ins. That's downtown and downtown west. Uh, do you guys, I, and we know, I mean, I've been told the reason that folks are breaking into cars nowadays, it's not for loose change, it's predominantly for firearms. Is that, is that why these car break-ins are occurring? Is that what folks are, these guys are usually looking for? Uh, they're usually looking for guns, yeah. and then a lot of times citizens leave their purses on the seat, they leave computers on the seat, the officers have what we call park smart cards, and when they're walking or doing a foot beat, if they notice that's in a vehicle, they'll put the card right. on the vehicle. But a lot of people, uh, we've had police chiefs to leave their guns and their vests in their cars. Do we have any idea, you know, if, if I break into 10 cars, how many guns does one wind up with, just statistically? Because I don't even know if these are getting, are the stolen guns actually getting reported by the, uh, the vehicle owners? Yes, sir, they are. And it's not unusual for one car to have four guns in it. If it's, a, like I said, a police chief or people from the military yeah. or police officers from other states leave their guns in their vehicle. So that's not, uh, it's not unusual. Okay, well, you know, given the fact that in the downtown district alone we've had 900 break-ins, if you're getting a car, getting, you know, if 10% a, if of those cars have one gun in them, that's a lot of weapons that are now on the street. And I know I talked to Captain Kreisman about this on a, multiple times a day. Um, and it's, in, I get, these, these are not cars all parked on the side of the street. These are happening in garages. And I, I do need some help. We're, we're, I'm working with the city councilors to try to hold some of these garage owners accountable because frankly, they're not doing their job with securing the vehicles that are in, that are in their garages. Yes, um, sir, Alderman. I, I'm glad you raised that because that is, that is one of the biggest challenges. So. Um, Renee has been able to determine that only a few of them actually have surveillance inside. So right. naturally, even if it's one person, or if you see somebody suspicious coming in and out of the location, uh, you know, some of them actually have somebody walking the ramps. But yep. we're, we're, I think we need to really work on trying to get some surveillance in there. That way you can see who's doing it. You can make comparisons, that type of thing. But actually, in most of the garages, there is no camera surveillance from floor to floor. Right. And so my request, I guess, would be, you know, more support for Renee's 
team. She's got a team of folks working on car break-ins, I know, around the clock, and they've had some success. But for one group, they catch one group, and then there's another group that pops up. And if we, we're going to stop this proliferation of illegal weapons on the street, um, this sort of what appears to be a low-level crime on its surface, I think, is a big contributing factor. So I, I do hope we'll uh, continue to aggressively pursue these guys uh, and clamp down on this. And I know I'll work with the city councilors on our end um, to try to to try to get some results from these garage owners who are not taking this seriously. Yes, sir. And I thank you. I would appreciate that. Captain Creesman does work hard with them, but the issue is, a lot of the owners don't want to spend the money. Right. They just don't, you know, we have them come in, we talk to them, and as I said earlier, talk about the real-time crime center, talk about hooking up surveillance with the real-time crime center. They go to the crime center, look, and they see the technology, they see what they, what we can do, but they don't want to spend the money. Some of them uh, employ off-duty police officers. Yeah. And then some of them don't. And as I said earlier, some of them have just security and you get what you pay for. You know, you hear a car alarm and you don't even get up to go see what it is. Right. But you get what you pay for. And, and that's where I think, you know, we can't police our way out of some of this. That's where if, if, a, if a garage owner is not going to be cooperative, we need to look outside of the police and say, let's condemn this building. If this was happening in a, in a residence and they were stealing a dozen guns a week from a residence, if they were being used in violent crimes, we'd condemn the place. We'd use our power hours as a city and the building division to do that. So I want to see that process done and I'll, I'll continue working with all of you uh, to make that happen because it's unacceptable the number of uh, number of guns being stolen out of vehicles downtown. Okay, um, thank you for covering that. I got one more topic here and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, and it's mainly about, you know, you're here today, so we, you've given us some good stats. Not all of this has been doom and gloom. Um, and I know I'm having a hard time sometimes tracking and celebrating your successes uh, and communicating those to my constituents. And I, I, su I suspect some of my colleagues are having similar issues. I, I don't know what's happened between the, the, you guys have a lot of community affairs officers and they're doing a, a pretty good job. And I hear about arrests all the time. And you know, we caught these guys responsible for these car break-ins or you know, this group of robbers. Um, and then you sort of, the, the communication stops. And I don't know if that's your department or the circuit attorney or what, but we can't track these cases. Uh, we've got neighbors who, who want to track these things, who want to show up for court, who want to be helpful, who want to give victim and neighborhood impact statements, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that. That information is not, doesn't appear to be widely available online anymore uh, to search for active cases by neighborhood. You used to be able to do that through the circuit attorney's website. I don't, I don't know that you can now. So I, I don't, I don't have, I'm, I'm not looking for an answer today, but I want you to know that it's, it's concerning to me that so me, I'm an attorney, I have access to CaseNet, I should be able to easily look this stuff up. I'm having a hard time doing it. I know my constituents are, I hear from them about it. So I'd like to get back to the point where we're doing a better job of celebrating our successes, where when you do catch the guy you think is responsible for a dozen, uh, a dozen armed robberies and he gets charged with a handful of them, let's make sure we're getting that information to the public because they can then track the case themselves. It's not on you to provide an update every step of the way, but that sort of initial charging decision, once it goes from your office to the, to the circuit attorney, that would be really helpful to have. All right. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Thank you all for being here. Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I want to acknowledge, I think, the only the only one standing here who was, hasn't been acknowledged, my former captain, Captain Sean Dace, who was a great partner down in the third district while you were down there. Appreciate your work. Um, uh, I have a series of questions I hope I get through them kind of quickly here. Going back to the Alderwoman from the Fifth, questions about the Armed Criminal Action Amendment. Uh, what exactly are we, I mean, I hear that we're looking to make that happen. What are we doing? Have we talked to the governor? Do we have the state legislature lined up? This is not something that this legislative body can do. In fact, our hands are tied with gun laws and many of these laws. But we need to know, you know, we don't have a... Uh, lobbyists here at the Board of Aldermen, the city does. Uh, what are we doing to make sure that we can be successful during this short legislative session ahead of us to see this amendment go through? The uh, next step uh, for me is to make sure that uh, Kansas City and the city of St. Louis uh, are on one accord 
with respect to this issue and make sure that our legislatures have been given information and hopefully uh, we have the, the appropriate people uh, willing to carry a bill for us. Um, uh, there will be additional discussions uh, with the governor with respect to this type of uh, legislation. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, uh, willing to listen to, to the community. And, and, and uh, uh, Auto Woman Hubbard uh, was, was absolutely right when she raised uh, a concern about the, the disparate impact on poor, marginalized, mm -hmm. uh, and minority folk. Uh, it will have no uh, uh, specific impact uh, on this classification of folk. Uh, what it is is just a law uh, that uh, would be applied uh, across the board, uh, irrespective of one station in life, uh, but it's something that I believe uh, where the consequences uh, will, will bring further consideration with, re with respect to gun crime. It, what can we do as a board of aldermen to support these efforts? I, I understand that it is the administration and, the, you know, and your responsibility, I suppose, to move that forward, but can, we have a commitment that this is a major priority for our city through this legislative session, and can you inform us as a, as a municipal legislative body what we can do to support those actions and what we can do uh, as you move forward with that? Well, I, I certainly think that you can support this, this effort, uh, uh, this effort to reduce crime overall and, and hopefully specifically this issue with respect to armed criminal action uh, by, by resolution or by you individually supporting and being vocal with respect to a need to do something different with respect to armed criminal action. I certainly would welcome all of that. What other actions as a legislative body can we take to support uh, initiatives to give the police department the tools it needs uh, to better protect our city? I mean, are there, I, I realize our hands are tied with respect to gun laws and other things, but can you provide a set of recommendations to this, to the Board of Aldermen on what we can adjust our own city laws uh, to, to be able to give you any better tools you need? You know, I've, I have uh, thought about that quite a bit with respect to what you can do in terms of our, our state's criminal laws. And uh, with all due respect, uh, there's not a whole lot uh, that uh, this, this body can do uh, other than being supportive uh, by way of resolution and otherwise. But uh, I will uh, uh, take your, your question and I will ponder it. And if there are things that I think that uh, this body can do independent uh, of uh, our uh, uh, state legislatures, I will certainly share that with you. Uh Judge, I really appreciate you acknowledging that there is very little that this body can do um, and being willing to, as we move forward, as any recommendations you know, pop up, that you continue to keep us informed and look to us as a, as a set of partners in this. Um, going back to the gun break-ins that the alderman from the 7th mentioned, 900, that is in incredibly alarming. Do we have any statistics on the number of stolen guns that came out of those car break-ins? And do we keep statistics on the stolen guns in general that are coming out of vehicles and, and home break-ins as a matter of a statistic? I'm looking at the statistics, the crime statistics online, and I see that we finally added uh, carjackings, which is a very, very good thing. I want to commend the police department for adding that so that we can start tracking that over, over time. We now have 258 year to date. I like to, that we can kind of view that moving forward. Can we also start tracking stolen, stolen guns? Where, in, whether they came out of a vehicle and whether they came out of a home and how they were obtained. I think these are statistics that the general public knows. We have a plethora of stolen guns coming out of somewhere. Where are they coming? And I want to, you know, so we can track that over time. Yes, yes ma'am. We, we, like neighborhoods from which they're coming. Yes, ma'am. We do, we do track, track them with it. In other words, what you have to do is you have to actually read the police report and find out. So in other words, we don't break them out like we do the other crimes. You mentioned carjacking. We, we separate that from robbery. So that would be uh, the stolen guns are in, involved either in theft from motor vehicles or burglaries. Sure. And so we, we, we keep the data. We just don't extract it on a regular basis. Well, the, 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 the crime statistics that the police department puts out on a monthly basis is very helpful. I look at it very regularly. I look at my neighborhoods. I look at overall crime stats, and I think a lot of people do. If we could add stolen guns to this by neighborhood and it, from a city as a whole, whether they came out of a vehicle and whether they came out of a home, 
uh, you know, I think, I, I, I think that um, uh, the police can probably uh, accomplish that. Um, it would be very, very onerous. Uh, but I think that we can, we can get the guns and we can get it, we can get it set out. You know, the problem that I'm always concerned about uh, is we, we open up these doors and, and now um, you, you ask me to, to set out uh, when, when uh, car keys are stolen or when, you know, when paintings are, are stolen guns. and things of that just sort. Guns. So I, I just want to make sure that, that, that we, this, this can become very uh, uh, fuzzy. If that's not feasible, I understand it can be very onerous, but I think, as you mentioned, that the plethora of guns is the single largest thing challenging the public safety in the city of St. Louis. Well, I did say that, so we'll make it happen. <laughs> so tracking those, <laughs> <laughs> tracking that, uh, the, the, the theft of those items, I think, is imperative. You know, when we can say, hey, a lot of these guns are coming out of these neighborhoods, and this is where we need to address the problem. This is where we need to keep clamp down on it. I think that would be very, very, very helpful. Uh, we talked talked about the, the rectangle, that north side rectangle, um, excuse me, triangle, um, but we also in the very beginning mentioned that we've got to focus on Gravoy Park, Dutchtown, and Baden. Those are the three neighborhoods that I heard mentioned. Gravoy Park and Dutchtown are in the south side. What is, are we having an equivalent uh, focus area outside of that rectangle because that the Gravoy Park, Dutchtown neighborhood triangle, excuse me, I keep, I, 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 uh, is spreading out. I mean, it doesn't just affect those neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real problem on the south side. And we have seen an increase in homicides in Gravoy Park, especially this month. It's been really, uh, one block has seen three homicides in the last three weeks. Um, so what is the equivalent down there on the south side? Jerry, you want to elaborate on that? Are, are you talking about the 3700 block of Minnesota? I am. That is the block that's had three homicides in the last three weeks, yes. And, and some of those were domestic in, 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 in nature, I understand that. Well, specifically what happens if we, what the officers do is identify who's involved, make an attempt to identify who specifically is involved in that area. And we also condemned, it's like quality of life. If we can get the house condemned and do things sure. like that. Uh, if it's a homicide, we are officers and detectives work closely with the homicide uh, section. And then specifically in that area, we'll have like the lieutenant or the sergeants that work in that area pay attention to what's going on. And just a lot of it has to do with identifying who's involved uh, in, in speaking with the neighbors and things like that. What I'm looking for, we have a north side triangle. <laughs> I, want a, I want a south side triangle or a rectangle. I mean, it's going to be a rectangle down there. But that is where the heart of a lot of the criminal activity on the south side is coming out of. And to see an equivalent down there, we have very similar crime statistics uh, as far as violent crime in those neighborhoods to what we see in that uh, triangle on the north side. Uh, we talked earlier about the park and walk, that getting out, addressing uh, uh, the trust issue between the community and the police department, that park and walk. Can we see an equivalent in the south side in the Gravoy Park, Dutchtown neighborhoods at, around Marquette Park, Gravoy Park? Those are the areas where we have a lot of families and we have a lot of kids, but we also have an enormous amount of criminal activity. Yes, ma'am, we can. And I know Captain Cousins encourages uh, his officers and the supervisors to, if they're not on a directed assignment or anything like that, to get out and to walk mm -hmm. in the neighborhoods. And another thing I know Captain Cousins does, and I help him with like the Peabody and the different projects. Mm -hmm. He, all over the summer, he got a group of children and uh, we took them to like the Science Center. We took them to the show uh, and the money for that, we all just put in. Uh, to do those types of community engagement because the community engagement piece is important. That it is. Um, um, going back to one of the issues that's been we've kind of uh, uh, roundabout addressed and we've talked about regularly is criminal be criminal uh, juvenile crime. Uh, this is something that uh, 
Judge, you have a lot of experience, and we have seen an enormous uptick in criminal activity uh, in the juvenile population in our city, specifically on the south side. And it's extremely alarming uh, because it's also very, very violent. And these kids are often getting arrested and then let immediately back out into the, to the street, and some to very disastrous ends. We had a young man who was arrested for felony criminal charges, was released the same day, and the next day lost his life to a bullet in a fight in a park. Um, this is extremely alarming, and the fact that we're not able to keep these kids in a situation behind, you know, uh, in, in custody, give them the help they need, address some of the family issues they have. What is it that is disabling us from being able to keep kids in custody when they are participating in very violent criminal activity? Well, uh, first, let me indicate that uh, a lot of attention is being given to uh, uh, offenses that are committed by uh, juveniles in the city of St. Louis. It is a part of the chief's ComStat. Uh, we have a very capable uh, lieutenant uh, who's responsible uh, for, for juvenile matters. Uh, they've identified uh, several dozen juveniles that uh, attention needs to be, be, be given to. Uh, the uh, process of detention um, um, in the city of St. Louis uh, in terms of juvenile offenses, uh, in terms of whether to detain or not detain, is done by an objective risk assessment tool. As you well know, uh, the laws in the state of Missouri does not permit a juvenile to be bonded out of jail. So the laws are very different as it relates to criminal procedure and juvenile procedure uh, in this country. Uh, but one of the differences is that there is a no bond law. And so whether a juvenile is released uh, after being arrested or whether a juvenile is detained, that juvenile has to be brought before a judge within three days. And that judge makes a decision based, uh, based upon objective risk assessment tools uh, following best practices uh, based upon the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, JDAI, which is a national best practice uh, uh, around the United States of America. And so while the juveniles receive certain laws as a result of case president and Ray Goff from 1967 to due process laws, there are certain laws that juveniles don't uh, benefit from, but there are others uh, that they do and one of them is the discretion of the judge uh, in the juvenile court. One of the issue, issues in, in de detention is uh, the point system, whether or not a juvenile before the judge has enough, accumulated enough points. That's to the be, risk assessment tool that yeah, I'm talking it, about. Is that something that we need to be reevaluating? What is the recommendation from your perspective as not only the director of public safety, but as the former judge over the juvenile courts, is that working well? I mean, I don't have a perspective on that. What I know, I see in the community kids getting arrested for armed criminal activity, shooting guns, stealing vehicles, getting arrested and being released the same day. And um, this is not only disastrous for the community, it's disastrous for that child and their family. It's not helping. Is but I don't, what I don't understand is if that is if these are just one-off cases. If we need to readjust that point system, what do we need to do to to make the community feel more comfortable and to better help the juveniles that are really participating in dangerous criminal activity? Well, I, I think the judges are doing a, a relatively decent job in terms of uh, assessing uh, the the risk of uh, of juveniles. Uh, um, Juveniles tend not to commit very serious crimes uh, uh, in our city, but when they do commit crimes, they're amplified. And so uh, that's, that's one of the, the, the biggest issues that, we are, are, that, that we're dealing with. When I took over the juvenile court uh, way back in tw 2007 as the chief judge of the juvenile court, uh, that risk assessment tool was put in place uh, so that we were able to avoid the disparate treatment of poor and African American kids. It was put in place because of the, the, the subjectiveness uh, that existed in the court in terms of, of when to detain and when not to detain. I think that it has worked extremely well. Now. Times have changed. Our community has changed with respect to an uptick on more violence and more violent crimes. And, and children that, just having th that access to those guns. And children guns having they didn't access have, to sure. guns. And, and, and uh, uh, 
that's again we we go back to the proliferation of guns uh, i think that uh, the court has worked well with the police department in terms of trying to come up with solutions. Uh, we do know that uh, there is a group of, of, of kids uh, that have uh, engaged in carjackings. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a group of kids that have engaged uh, 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 in serious assaultive behaviors. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to address that. Uh, uh, again, um, as it relates to to the types of crimes that are occurring in our city, there's a small amount of folk mm -hmm. that are engaging in these crimes. Uh, my biggest concern, of course, uh, beyond or behind the, the uh, proliferation of guns is a recidivism problem. We're, we're going to have to fix that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's, I believe, a conversation that we we're able to have with the judges. Are we, are we tracking the juvenile criminal behavior? So we have all these crime stats and, you know, I keep hearing from the police department, from third district officers, from members of the community, victims of crime, that we're seeing an uptick in Jim. Are we tracking that? Can we share any of that data? Not specific information about particular juveniles, but just the, this, the criminal activity and whether or not, you know, to, to guide us on whether we need more resources for their families, what we need to do to better help pull them out of that uh, dangerous activity. Yes, yes, ma'am. So uh, probably in the last four months, so we've identified 48 chronic juvenile violent offenders. Um, you did, we did mention though that only 11 of them are in custody as we speak. But I mean, as a as a ma as a matter of criminal activity as a whole, what percentage is per being you know what percentage of this criminal activity is juvenile crime, and you know are we tracking that over time? Whether that's increasing, decreasing, whether we you know. We've seen some really great statistics here today, and I'm just looking for some information to, on the criminal or on the juvenile aspect of it. Every year, the juvenile court uh, publishes a uh, a juvenile report card, and it talks about the number of of arrests, the number of adjudications, the type of dispositions. All of that information is is, is public, and it's made available to to anybody that's 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 looking. Now, if you're asking the question, and I'm not sure what you're asking, if you're asking whether there's an uptick in terms of uh, uh, juvenile offenses, the answer would be yes. If the, is there an uptick in terms of the violence, the types of offenses that the juveniles are, are committing, the answer would be yes. Uh, but it's still a very small percentage of children. So, Judge, that's what I'm, that's the data that I'm looking for or hoping that we can share with the public. What does that uptick look like? What is that increase in juvenile criminal behavior as a percentage of the overall crime or as a percentage of just juvenile crime in general? Just so we have a better understanding of where these shifts are happening and so we can better allocate resources. For example, the Board of Aldermen right now is in the process of allocating about a million dollars for that Prop S, you know, to, to try and address crime from the root cause. Keeping in mind, you know, shifts in juvenile criminal behavior is important to us as we evaluate those programs and evaluate the money that we are spending and allocating for things like that. So if there's, if you can share those statistics, I think that would be very, very helpful. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is traffic enforcement. We've talked about this. I know it can be uh, it's a low level crime, but when you're living in a neighborhood that is, you know, riddled with gunfire, et cetera, and has all these other issues, and people are still speeding through your community, it really contributes to a sense of lawlessness, and it really contributes to a lower quality of life for everyone, especially children who can't play in the streets, who can't ride their bikes because people are driving like maniacs. Uh, you mentioned that we have a traffic enforcement department. Where are they enforcing traffic? Um, I don't see them. The, I really don't. Um, I, you know, I realized that we said that in the third district, when officers aren't doing other things, they're always doing something in the third district. So there's never that downtime to, you know, make sure somebody isn't going 75 miles an hour down a residential street. If we have a traffic enforcement department, can we share the information about where they're being deployed in the city? I know I see them in Forest Park, and I do see them in certain areas, but I don't see them in the neighborhoods where people 
the densely populated neighborhoods where people live. Yes, ma'am. That's that's something that that we've heard across the city, and probably in every um, um, ward meeting that we've been to, people have complained about traffic safety. So what we've done is put our traffic safety officers on a lot of the main thoroughfares. And so uh, when people talk about a lot of the stop signs and that, I mean, we, we really have to limit it to some of the, the major streets, Kings Highways, Chippewas, the, the, big, the big streets, as opposed to some of the, the smaller streets. And so they, they're deployed across the city, and we, we get our information from attending community meetings to see which ones are being prioritized. I know like in the 6th District might be Goodfellow, but so we, we really focus our traffic safety officers on some of the main thoroughfares, Natural Bridge, um, and in southern places where, where well, whatever be considered a large street. I'd like to see some of the, you know, the, those machines that track speed sure. be placed on Keokuk or be placed on California or some of these neighborhood streets where I know people are going 60 miles an hour through residential neighborhoods. They're not, there's no way they can stop at a stop sign because they're going 50 miles an hour. Yes, <laughs> and you know, I'm not looking for punishing people uh, you know, get, extracting fees for traffic violations, but maybe stopping them and getting them in compliance with basic. Right. Uh, and, and the district cabinets have the laws. ability to move those those trailers around, I think that so would we be have access to the trailers. Extremely helpful. They could they could move them as they see most helpful. If we could see uh, presence in Gravway Park and Dutchdown, those two neighborhoods you mentioned at the offset, that would be very very meaningful to the folks that live there. Um, you know, I appreciate the alderman from the seventh mentioning the homicide rate. You know, the the solve rate. It's alarming to me that when we came under local control, that solve rate fell down below 50%. It stayed there for several years. We're just now getting back up to 50%. I think that's a good thing. I commend uh, uh, Captain, Cous or Captain Dace for that because uh, I believe you're over homic homicide now. Is that right? Um, but we need to bring that up to the national average, and we're still far below the national average on what we're able to solve. And I think between that and some of these quality of life, you know, if we can start addressing the traffic, you know, and people being able to just live normal lives on their blocks without having to deal with um, extreme levels of just petty, you know, criminal activity, it would be a, it would go a long way. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your time, and I thank you all for being here today. Mm -hmm. Okay, ma'am. Gravois Park in Dutchtown is mine. We'll, I'll talk with you. We'll take care of it. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Muhammad. Oh, my God. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's not working. Some of, the, some of them aren't working. I'll take this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, and to the Deputy Chiefs as well, and also thank you, uh, Mr. Director. Uh, real quick, uh, when you was mentioning main thoroughfares and traffic enforcement, uh, I do have to say our natural bridge has become much more safer, uh, and I thank you, Director, for doing that. I know you did increase traffic fines not too long ago, uh, uh, shortly past this year, so I appreciate that. Uh, I do see traffic enforcement every day on Natural Bridge. Uh, got stopped not too long ago. Uh, <laughs> not too long ago. Um, uh, my questions are for uh, Lieutenant Robinson. Uh, how many officers do you have under your command? Right at 293. How many are white shirts? White shirts. I got two captains. How many sergeants do you have, sir? How many sergeants? I think I, right at 20, 22, 22 sergeants, I believe. Okay. Do you feel like your bureau in North Patrol is um, under manpower? I, I think we're experiencing that department-wide relative to manpower issues. And um, we're doing, as far as my bureau right now, they're working very efficiently. But uh, it's always we could use more officers. And I know you mentioned earlier the neighborhoods that you were targeting as far as violent crime. Yes, sir. Uh, can you mention those neighborhoods one more time for me, specifically on Moore 
interested in my ward, of course, but could you mention those neighborhoods one more time? Well, we're always challenged by Baden and Walnut Park and Wells Goodfellow as far as the neighborhoods are concerned. And um, the, the, the crime, a lot of our crime is transit, but consistently those neighborhoods uh, give us the most challenges year in and year out. And Penrose, yes. Now, what is the main problem? Penrose is in my ward. What is the main uh, problem with Penrose from what, your perspective? Aggravated assaults. And what is comprehensively being done to, to counteract that, though? A lot of intervention relative to the gang unit intervention over in those wards, over in, that, over in those neighborhoods, and also directed patrol relative to uh, that neighborhood. And then we, I, I, I think uh, Perry is getting ready to start a, uh, the, the park and walk initiative over there also. Who commands the gang intervention unit? Uh, Sergeant Robert Ogilvie and myself. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant. Chief, yes, uh, now I, I know everything comes down to money and resources. Uh, how do we get more of a police presence in North St. Louis without directly impacting your budget? Right. So the, so the challenge, I think uh, Colonel Robinson alluded to it, so the challenge is, is that we're 135 officers down. We try to make sure that, that no district suffers or, or our patrol division suffers more than the next one. So it, so it is an ongoing challenge. We just graduated um, uh, 20 officers out of the academy. So I say that, that brought us to 135. We were down like 155. So point being is that a, cl a close watch on making sure that no district suffers any more than the next is, is, is the biggest challenge. And then, of course, as we see violent crime patterns appear, we can always send mobile reserve or the SWAT team or traffic safety or anti-crime or any one of our specialized units to try to buttress the efforts of those captains. I mean, so I like that idea, but every day when I talk to residents in, the, in my ward specifically, uh, are just residents in North St. Louis, and I hear the same issues with the police department that whenever they call, officers don't come, or they don't see enough of a police presence. Again, I know that uh, uh, our lieutenants have large districts, and it's not that easy to manage. But what do we do to fix that problem? Is there a solution right now? Is there something that we can do to, uh, to curve... Uh, uh, to curb the time it takes to get to an incident, or is it something we can do to increase police presence in the most crime-ridden neighborhoods? Yes, sir. So, so I, th I think that our our response to um, um, priority one and priority two calls, the ones ones were were uh, directly related to people violence and those types of calls. Our our um, response to that is is probably inside of five to six minutes on priority one and two. So. That's, that's when people complain, they're, they're, they're oftentimes talking about things that we can't rush to. They might be, they might be referring to um, a suspicious person selling drugs, those types of calls. So our response to one in priorities one and two is consistent with the national average. Our, our response to suspicious persons selling drugs and, and some of the quality of life things because of our deficit of officers has been challenged. But hopefully, um, hey, the, we, we all know that the, um, the mayor just approached the, the um, Civil Service Commission about waivers. Hopefully that'll help. So there's 50 waivers out there. I'm hoping that, that once we um, um, get some movement on that, that that, could, that is, per, is potentially something that could be reconsidered. Um, we, have a, we have 30 officers, a, a 30 cadets inside of our cadet program. You know, one of them is actually going to start the academy. So that's, that's an, also an ongoing process. Uh, we're also um, doing some heavy uh, advertisement or recruitment efforts by going to job fairs, we've increased that. Again, the police foundation has allowed us uh, more monies to allow some of our uh, recruiters, recruiters to travel a little bit farther out than what they normally go. And so we're, we're doing those kind of things, Alderman, to try to replenish uh, those ranks. Uh, replenishment of those ranks will clearly get a lot more visibility and a lot more of what you're referring to about people, uh, people noticing a lack of visibility. Now, are we down 135 officers because of budget or are we down because it's hard to recruit people 
to the police department. Hard to recruit. Yeah, there, there's actually budgeted amount for those officers. We just don't have them. I, I can give you a quick anecdote. We've I, I, la the last couple of classes, I picked down to the to the last available person. And so we what we don't have when they, when, when all of us came on, there was a two year waiting list to get on the police department. That's non-existent. So it, it, as quickly as we can get qualified people, we want to hire them. Now, what is the number one factor preventing uh, people from joining our police department? Yes, sir. I believe the number one hindrance to people's uh, hesitation is having to move locations. We're the only department in the region um, that has a res residency requirement. And so I think that I've heard anecdotally that folks would, would, would love to work for us. Uh, we certainly are a class, class A police department. At the same time, when you talk about uplifting families, uh, people just uh, have, have reservations about doing that level of, of, of uh, inconvenience in order to come to the city. If, if, if you recall, if, you know, if we think about the generation of people that would come on the police department, hey, uh, I went through the DSEC program, a lot of our kids in the city went to county schools, and so they got a lot of friends out there. When people join the police department, say, hey, let's go join. It might be three or four of us. And so that's a hurdle that we, that we have that the other um, regional police departments do not have, including the Highway Patrol. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I want to say thank you, Chief, <laughs> and thank you, Director Edwards. Um, you guys have been fairly easy to work with, uh, in my opinion, in my experience, and also Lieutenant Robinson. Uh, so I appreciate you guys and all you do for my community and the entire city. Thank you, sir. And, and just a disclaimer, if any 21st Ward resident is listening or watching, Crime is down in the 21st Ward, 13%. Okay. Alderwoman Boyd, any questions? Uh, hello. Hello. <laughs> well, I, first I need to thank you, Chief, for the first time uh, we have a plan. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of my ward because I think we're ahead of the game. Uh, you and uh, Judge Edwards spoke to our safety committee and you all have done leaps and bounds to work with us. But I'm real clear that it takes several things to bring what we have to the table and to existence. And uh, we, Walnut Park West, crime has dropped by 85% in murder. And so that's a history to me. And so within a year, we dropped that. And I think it was because of communication, education of the residents, uh, participation, uh, and they have built the trust back into the 6th District. The residents over there feel like we're getting the old 6th District back. And so thank you, Chief. And I think it's because you were a part of that before you became Chief. So you knew what the issues that we were up against. <clears throat> and uh, the triangle, I thank you for that. And I'm uh, appreciative of you all listening. I think uh, Captain Johnson kind of got a eye opening with me because he did not know of an older person that was that committed and involved. And so I don't have the problems that I hear other older people saying because I am communicated with on a regular basis. He is out there in the community. The people on Plover appreciate you all because those people could not live in their community. They felt like they were going to have to leave. So I just want to thank you all for what you have done. I look forward to working with you all because, again, you have a plan. And we didn't have that before. So thank both of you all, thank all of you all for what you have done to help the 27 war to rebuild itself back up. Thank you, thank you ma'am. You are. That's all? Over? That's it. Okay, then. Uh, that completes all the members of the committee. We do have a couple of the, all the people here. We could allot them a short time if they have any questions. Alderwoman Davis. Did you have any comments or questions? Good morning to everyone. Good morning. 
everybody standing here, I have worked very closely with over the years. Uh, not as much with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dace, but I know of his performance. You, you just promoted him. Field promotion. Oh, I'm sorry. You, I <laughs> thought you had already. Twice. Had. Well, he needs to be promoted. But what I want to talk about is um, the accountability for all of us. And when I say all of us, I say the same thing when I'm talking to my constituency. You cannot point your finger. You cannot expect the police to do everything because you can't. You're not my readers. You don't have a crystal ball that tells you when a fool is going to be a fool or when a troubled individual is going to commit a crime. You don't have that ability, nor do I or anybody else. But what we do have the ability to do is for parents to be more responsible, for the next door neighbor who knows and sees what's going on to be more responsible and share that information, however they choose to share it. Everybody's not comfortable calling 911. But what we need to do is educate people on all the other ways that they can get information to us. And that's one of the things that we work on constantly. What I love about my area, even though I don't like having three captains now, I'm, I'm back in the old day, I like one captain, but all three of them have the same way of communicating. That's frequently and with substance. And so that empowers the residents. It gives me more information. And you can tell the difference uh, where there's a lot of communication and a lot of support when you just look at the stats. When people, are, when people are educated, they can actually help you do your job. I know that on a regular basis. But we got so much to do. Unfortunately, our children are not getting the character building that they used to get from church, school, and many other sources. And so we have to fill in those gaps. And we got to catch them wherever they are and try to turn them around. Uh, our federal and state laws didn't help us with guns. And they know that. These young people know it. You know, when I asked someone not to have an AK-47 in my park, they told me it was not my business and that uh, they're allowed to have their guns anywhere they want them now. So that's a, that's a problem. But we have to educate people on how to get around that. Uh, what I want to see is more opportunities for us. I think the city, of, um, with our budget, with block grants and the public safety funds are looking at those things. We need more block units, organized block units that are actually operating like they operate so well in the Crondelet area. They have over 300 organized block units and they work together and they work with you. So those types of things are what we need to continue to improve upon. I am not going to hit you and slam you in the public or anywhere else about what you haven't done because I know that you're working every day. My one captain that has the majority of my ward, she comes and answers calls herself when there's nobody else available. Captain Creaseman, because I've called before and I watched what happened. And she showed up and then when somebody else was free, they were there about five minutes later. But I know what you're doing, you're doing the best you can do. But we have a problem with believing that, oh, woe is me, instead of stepping up to the plate, using every resource that we have collectively, not separately. That's the problem, collectively. And I see you going in that direction to bring us all together. I'm here to help. I'm here to listen. I'm here to share anything new I find out about. But at the end of the day, this, not just the city, this region needs to come together. Because you see, it's not just the city of St. Louis. It's Normandy, it's Pagedale, it's Chesterfield, it's Clayton, it's everywhere. And so we have to work together. And I know that you're reaching out, and I just wanted to say thank you. But I know until we decide that we are going to be a collective force that supports the police department, and when somebody does something wrong, I'm right there with you too to get them. Anytime an officer is out of line, we have to handle that. But as a whole, we have to work together and support the police department. And I say that to my residents all the time. Because where would you be and how would you live if you weren't there? I don't want to experience that. I need you. 
So I want to say thank you to all of you. But in the meantime, residents, let's get on board. Let's do everything we can and organize community block units so that people know we're watching you and we will tell on you. So I thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. I believe that completes all the members of the committee. You didn't have any questions? Okay, then. Alderman Rice did not have any questions. Again, then we thank you <coughs> for coming out today. I will we'll get with you and work out something on a more regular basis. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yes. Chairperson. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't conclude by saying that we have a good police department. Mm -hmm. We have brave men and women that go to work every single day for the citizens of the city of St. Louis. They are committed. And indeed, I believe they love our city. And so we've been reluctant to celebrate all of the things that you heard today. We've been reluctant to do that because I understand that the work is not done. And we have to work harder every single day to make sure that we keep our city safe. In fact, but more importantly, that the citizens of the city of St. Louis do indeed feel safe. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear here this morning. And whenever you would like, we would be happy to spend two hours with you. <laughs> okay, then we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, that completes our agenda item today. The uh, meeting is adjourned.